I remembered to hit the record button this time, so that's half the battle. Come on in and join us. We'll take just a minute for, for the room to fill up. I meant to tell you guys we had 115 people sign up. Right. So not to make anybody nervous. That's exciting. So as folks are joining us, um, we need to send up a bat signal to Jim West. <laughs> yes, we are missing <laughs> one of our. We're, we're missing. We're, we're missing Jim. So. Um, we're hoping that he's going to come come along in due time. But if anybody has Jim's phone number, maybe you could give him a call real quick. Hopefully, he'll just firing off an email real quick. Ah, we have a wide international audience with us today as well. We do. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then, and hopefully Jim will join us. If not, uh, we uh, we certainly have enough ground to cover. Uh, Jennifer is asking if Bryant is watching. Bryant, if you're watching, you're probably the one that would have Jim's phone number. I didn't think to get that, but. He is listed uh, amongst the participants, so. Who, uh, uh, Brian is? Yes. Okay. So, Brian, if you could, if you could call Jim real quick. I just sent him an email, but. Um, all right. Well, welcome to the home stretch of Fitzgerald Summer School. After this uh, panel today, which I'm really looking forward to, uh, we are down to two sessions. We'll have a session called Where in the World Are Scott and Zelda on Monday, July 12th at 1 p.m. And that is where we are going to announce the site of the 2023 conference. So you definitely want to tune in for that. We've also got uh, a lot of fun little videos we have made visiting different Scott and Zelda sites around the world to quiz your geographic knowledge and to be amused by my bad pronunciation of people's names. Uh, after that, a uh, week from today, on July 14th, we're going to have a writing and publishing workshop uh, with uh, the uh, several journal editors, folks from 20th Century Literature, Arizona Quarterly, the Hemingway Review, and the acquisitions editors at uh, Louisiana State University Press and at South Carolina Press, University of South Carolina Press. So I'd like to ask anybody who's interested in publishing, um, we're gonna be talking the do's and don'ts and how the marketplace is changing. But if any of you are interested yourselves or if you have students that are interested, this is an excellent opportunity to kind of get the nitty gritty about how the marketplace is changing and it's changing very rapidly. Uh, on us all. Um, so we've had a great experience uh, the past, gosh, almost a month now of doing these webinars. And uh, we've had a lot of fun, a lot of great conversations. So for this one, I am going to turn it over to our host. I am, I am just the Vanna White of this particular production. So I'm going to turn it over to our Pat Sajak, who is Aaron E. Templeton who happens to be the Dean of the College of Humanities, Science and Business at uh, Converse College there in the Carolinas. University now, as of University. July 1st, we oh, are Converse well, University. Excellent, um, that is wonderful, congratulations. <laughs> so that means Aaron has even more work to do now. <laughs> so uh, Aaron is a board member of the Fitzgerald Society. More importantly, she wrote the really excellent introduction to Save Me the Waltz that Handheld Press did 
which is a great edition of that book. And she's also published on William Carlos Williams and the Wasteland. And I know that she is working furiously on Tender is a Night from Michael Nolan's updated Cambridge Companion, because I saw her dog began to eat her book the other day. So we are, <laughs> we're glad we prevented that crisis. Uh, but Erin has also written for the Chronicle of Higher Education. And if you didn't see it in our uh, little photo introduction, I just found this out myself. She ran the Boston Marathon in 2017. So way to make us feel all bad, Erin. We <laughs> appreciate that. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. I'm going to turn my camera off and Aaron will introduce our panelists and we will just run from there. Yeah, thank you, Kirk. We are, um, as you know, I mean, I don't think that our, our panelists really need a whole lot of introduction, but, um, you know, and hopefully Jim West will be joining us in due time. But, uh, you know, even if he can't make it for whatever reason, we've got two luminaries in Fitzgerald studies. Um, David Brown has written the most recent biography of F. Scott Fitzgerald, Paradise Lost, that was just published a couple of years ago, uh, May in 2017. Um, and Sarah Churchwell, Careless People, um, fantastic book about Gatsby and the era, um, also Behold America, um, and a lot of other public scholarship about American studies, um, both in the 20s and in the present day. Um, so you know the, the topic of our session today is obscure facts and figures um, having to do with Fitzgerald studies. Um, and basically our panelists were asked to just plumb the depths of their knowledge and come up with fun facts and strange things that you might not know about Scott and Zelda and um, their lives, their circle, um, the historical, intellectual, cultural context of their work. Um, and so we'll just kind of go back and forth and we'll see how things sort of develop. And if you have questions, please use the Q and A um, little tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will be keeping an eye on things to, to make sure that if you have questions, we get those to our, to our guests. Um, and also the chat, but sometimes the chat gets a little unwieldy. So Q and A is the best place. You can pop a question, you can upvote somebody else's. And I think we might have, Hopefully, our third panelist. Um, <laughs> Jim likes to make a dramatic entrance, as we all know. <laughs> so. I apologize. They are bearing a, 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 a tropical hurricane is bearing down on us. Oh, no. And, uh, so I was outside taking the cushions off the lawn furniture. <laughs> Uh, completely slipped my mind. Senior moment. Uh, I'll, I'll simply join the incognito. If that's I think that ship sailed about 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's like listening to the ghost of the machine <laughs> like this. <laughs> the voice of God, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> from the newsreels. Oh my God, that's so funny. This I reminds mean, me of how we used to have a joke about 10 years ago that instead of the uh, WWJD bracelets, we would all wear WWJLW w the third <laughs> bracelets. I, I, I. Well, anyway, here I am. I hope you, you've gone ahead without me. I had just introduced our other panelists, and I think, you know, Jim, you you have done so many amazing things for Fitzgerald Studies that I, I we would be here all day if I even tried to list them. Um, and I, I'm sure that it, I'm sure that everybody's already familiar with with your work. But since I do have it right here, Cambridge edition of basically everything, but Tenders the Night is the one that my dog was trying to chew on the other day. Um, I had to stop him from from doing that, but. Um, you know, the general editor of the Cambridge series of, of Fitzgerald's works, um, amongst many, many other things. Um, so, hey, so let's get you going. Have, do you all have a video of me? Can you see me? No, it's like a vaporous presence uh, on your screen. <laughs> there he is. Hello. <laughs> Yay. I feel right. like I know the back of your computer more intimately than I want to, though. 
<laughs> Excellent. Now we can begin. <laughs> um, so David, what you got for us? Okay, so I'm actually an historian, uh, American cultural intellectual history. So that's pretty much how I read F. Scott Fitzgerald. So my choices have to do with people that, that I'm familiar with in a slightly different context. So I'll just start off with Thorsten Veblen because I read Veblen years ago. Um, uh, here with this classic account of American consumerism, the theory of the leisure class. It was published in 1899. And we might know it because of that, that, that terrific phrase he kind of coined, um, conspicuous consumption. And so, for example, you know, when, I, when, I, when I read um, um, Gary Gatsby, and there's that iconic scene of, of Fitzgerald tossing around those shirts, or the, um, you know, the great automobiles, or the parties, or how Fitzgerald describes the, um, the edibles at the parties. You know, this is the great American consumer republic, and, and this is the notion of, um, of trying to get people's attention, um, not so much by you know, the content of your character, but by what kind of car you have or what kind of shirt you have. And so, you know, uh, Veblen pokes a lot of fun at this. Um, and this is all part of the great American barbecue, but there's a sharpness behind it as well. It cuts because there is this sort of, you know, tragic notion that we didn't all come out here, you know, as, as, as immigrants just to consume. But, but we came here to, to, be, to be free people in some sense, presumably. And Veblen, um, he pokes holes at that. And I think that Fitzgerald also pokes holes in that as well, um, slightly subversively and with some fun, but it's there. And so what, what excites me is that someone like us, Scott Fitzgerald, um, who walked away with Princeton with a lot of terrific experience, not a college degree, uh, didn't need one uh, to, to think about the great American consumer republic. Uh, so that's one for me. Sarah? So are we go we're going in like in a, in a round robin? Okay, so, um, so mine are kind of intertwined. Uh, I wasn't sure if we were doing them at once or, or um, as we go. So um, I, uh, I'm also, uh, like David, kind of come at, I mean, I was trained as a literary critic, but increasingly my work is around American cultural history more broadly. And, um, and then kind of where Fitzgerald sort of sits squarely at the center of that, and then I kind of like radiate out. And um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build up to a figure um, who actually links my two most recent books, um, but I'm gonna start um, with some other ones because they, they're kind of, as I said, kind of inner, I'm going with a small little circle here. Um, so I'm going to start with Burton Rasco, um, who is uh, a favorite figure of mine. Um, I didn't know about Rasco when I started researching Fitzgerald, um, and um, and particularly uh, when I started working, you know, deep, you know, in a, in a concerted way on the book that became Careless People. But I rapidly um, came across him because I was doing a lot of work in the primary newspaper archive. Um, trying to reconstruct the world of 1922 because I wanted to write a kind of nonfiction version of Gadsby, um, kind of do the nonfictional uh, um, side of what Fitzgerald fictionalizes um, in Gadsby, which actually always reminds me of one of my favorite stories about publishing Carol's People, which I'll just say as an aside because it was so hilarious. Because at one point when I was working on Carol's People and I was talking to my editor about how I was trying to create novelistic detail but I couldn't fictionalize because it was a nonfiction book. And so I always had this example of Zelda in a green dress where I wanted to like evoke Zelda on a given day, but if I couldn't establish that she had a green dress, then I wasn't allowed to put her in a green dress. And as my um, editor and I were talking this through, my, and this was kind of, you know, well into the composition. Um, and she was sort of just thinking out loud and she went, well, I don't know if you thought about fictionalizing it, like maybe we should just fictionalize it and maybe we should, you know, move away from the, the strict nonfiction. And I just started laughing and I was like, well, no, because this is a, about an account of Scott Fitzgerald's, uh, of, of the real events that inspired The Great Gatsby. And there has been a novel written about that and it's called The Great Gatsby. So <laughs> I don't think I should compete with that. <laughs> um, anyway, I was so, um, so I was trying to pull up those details. And, and so it was obviously the newspapers that were gonna give me a lot of that, um, that texture, but, through at least a reasonably nonfiction, at least I hadn't made it up, even if other people had. And that brings me um, 
to Rasco because Rasco is a really interesting figure. So he was um, uh, an editor of the uh, New York Tribune and then later of the Herald. Um, he also later became um, uh, an editor of the Bookman. But in the early 1920s, when he was publishing the books pages for the New York Tribune, he actually was the editor who uh, commissioned Zelda's first piece of writing that uh, all of us are familiar with, her facetious review of The Beautiful and Damned. It was his idea um, to ask Zelda to do that after he'd met Scott and Zelda when they came um, to New York for the publication of The Beautiful and Damned. And, um, and he was a really interesting figure because he was um, a critic that uh, he was greatly respected um, by many in Fitzgerald's circle, including uh, Edmund Wilson. And as we all know, um, Wilson was, you know, um, not uh, not liberal always with his literary praise. But he he later said that he thought that Burton Rasco at his best was one of the best critics of the of New York in the early 1920s. And Rasco was somebody who early championed the wasteland. He was writing about the wasteland on November 5th, 1922, before Livright had even published the book version of it. And he was and he could see what it was that Eliot was doing. Um, he um, he wrote about. Uh, um, I'm gonna say Remembrance of Things Past, which dates me because of course it is um, In Search of Lost Time. Um, but he was writing about Proust um, in the Chicago Tribune uh, several years before Moncrief's uh, translation brought Proust to English reading audiences for the first time. So Rasco had read him in the original. So he was really a tastemaker. I mean, he certainly wanted to be a tastemaker and that was what he was working at. But he also started publishing this literary gossip column called A Bookman's Day Book. Um, in uh, the Tribune, and there's uh, Fitzgerald, Scott, and Zelda um, appear in it a lot. He was, um, he, Roscoe was a kind of ancillary member of the Round Table, so there are a lot mm -hmm. of stories about the um, about the Algonquin and all of that. And then what happened was in the correspondence that. Um, particularly between Fitzgerald and Wilson um, around that time, it turns out that Rasco was also something of a fabulist. So although he's, he's presenting these gossip columns as fact and, he's, and he is this kind of literary tastemaker, he's also a deeply unreliable narrator, um, which I found you know, fascinating as a way of thinking through questions of unreliable narration in the world that Fitzgerald is depicting in the real world, as well as of course in the novel itself. So Rasco is my first. Excellent. Jim? It's my turn. It is. Um, <laughs> well, if you all excuse these glasses. I'm looking at myself. I got them the other day, and they have this blue cast on them, which actually is very uh, comfortable when you're using a computer. But I didn't realize I, I'm quite. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to keep them on. I think they look moderately cool. Um, the item I've been thinking about um, has to do with the lost battalion. You run across all kinds of odd things when you annotate literary fiction, and I've pretty much annotated all of Fitzgerald's. And so uh, <clears throat> this has to do with an incident in World War One that I certainly didn't know anything about it until I began to look into it. Uh, all of you will remember in The Great Gatsby uh, when Gatsby is first uh, telling Nick about his, his life and about his um, experience in the war. And on page 79 of the first edition and the very oral, we have this paragraph. Then came the war, old sport. It was a great relief, and I tried very hard to die, but I seemed to bear an enchanted life. And then he goes into a story. In the Argonne Forest, I took two machine gun detachments so far forward that there was a half mile gap on either side of us where the in infantry couldn't advance. We stayed there two days and two nights, 130 men with 16 Lewis guns. And when the infantry came up at last, they found the insignia of three German divisions among the piles of dead. I was promoted to be a major, and every allied government gave me a decoration. Even Montenegro, little Montenegro, down on the Adriatic Sea. So we all remember that. We remember little Montenegro. And uh, <clears throat> 
only for the first 30 or 40 years when I read and taught The Great Gatsby, I thought, well, that's a great story. Fitzgerald just dreamed it up. Uh, and then, somehow or another, in the process of doing annotations, I learned of The Lost <laughs> Battalion. And the story of The Lost Battalion uh, actually concerns the Mers Argonne offensive. What happened was that a battalion from the 77th Division of American Forces, uh, <clears throat> 550. And can you talk a little bit louder? I think we're having a, a bit of bit of a hard time hearing you. Let's see. How's that? A little bit better. Wait a minute. I don't want to miss even a syllable. Volume was good there for a while, Jim. I think it, it felt like something covered your mic up. How's that? Mm -hmm. No better? A little muffled still. Is that any better? That's my speakers. Y'all want to go on without me while I... There we go. There you are. There you are. Whatever you oh. just did. All right. All right. I'm not going to touch a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I read that passage uh, from The Great Gatsby in which um, Gatsby is telling of his war experiences to Nick, and he mentions going too far forward, being cut off, and uh, surviving with his men, the men being de decorated, uh, his medal from a little Montenegro. Well, it turns out that Fitzgerald based that passage on a real uh, incident from the war. This was the story of the lost battalion um, from the 77th Division of American Forces, 550 men in the Battle of the Argonne Forest, who did, in fact, go too far forward, lost touch with the um, um, forces on either side of them and were surrounded by the German forces. Um, they were commanded by a man named Whittlesey, Major Whittlesey, and so they dug in. It was a long fight. They could only communicate with uh, headquarters by carrier pigeons, if you can imagine. 194 men survived, and eventually the Allies came up and rescued them. Whittlesey and several of the others received the Congressional Medal of Honor, and uh, many of the other men there received other decorations. So I'm sure this is what Fitzgerald based the incident on. Uh, the story of the Lost Battalion was very romantic in a war that didn't have too many romantic heroes, and uh, especially in the ground fighting. It was all over the newspapers. Uh, Whittlesey was promoted to colonel and was taken around the country. Uh, he gave speeches, he was much honored. And uh, this is the sort of thing that Fitzgerald would have known about. So again, as I read The Great Gatsby, I thought, well, it's interesting. Fitzgerald took a real incident and transformed it into something that Jay Gatsby actually did to earn his medal. But then, not long ago, being a skeptical person, I began to think about it some more, and I began to wonder whether Gatsby had not taken the story of the Lost Battalion and adapted it for himself, uh, making himself the hero and pulling out his medal from Little Montenegro. 
it's really a sad story because uh, Colonel Whittlesey felt that he was not, in fact, a hero, that he had failed his men by getting out too far forward, and uh, he uh, blamed himself for the many deaths and injuries that resulted, so much so that in 1921, he committed suicide uh, on the way on a boat heading from New York to Havana, Cuba. He disappeared off the side and he left in his cabin various messages uh, so that he took his own life. Um, it's the sort of thing we'll never really know. Was Gatsby telling the truth? Did Fitzgerald mean for us to believe he was telling the truth? Or did he mean for us to think, well, this is just another one of those stories like living in all the capitals of Europe and writing poetry for myself and collecting jewels and all of the other business that Nick is very skeptical of. All of that is in this, this passage. Um, so I put that out for someone to investigate. There's actually a lot on the Lost Battalion and uh, uh, a lot of books, a lot of newspaper coverage at the time, and I think one movie. Uh, so it would be an interesting thing for a, a, a young scholar to tackle. Okay, so uh, I guess I'm up again, Aaron. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to toss out Henry Adams. Uh, this is the uh, great grandson of John and grandson of John Quincy Adams, part of that famous family. Uh, I'm sure um, a lot of people listening uh, knows that, that there's a personal connection here. Uh, Fitzgerald had dropped Henry Adams into this side of paradise as Thornton Hancock. Um, and uh, the connection presumably is Father uh, Sigourney Fay, who knew Adams. Um, there's correspondence between the two, and presumably um, uh, he had served as conduit, bringing Fitzgerald um, to Washington to meet the old man. Um, but what I find very interesting, uh, the connection is that, uh, you know, Henry Adams, uh, he, was, he was really critical of this you know, kind of Gilded Age exuberance. And uh, around the turn of the century, uh, he wrote a private book, um, self-published, um, Mont Saint-Michel and Charles. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have been to Mont Saint-Michel. This is a tidal island you know, off the coast of France. And for Henry Adams, this was the great spirit of um, medievalism. Uh, he calls it um, a study of 13th century multiplicity which he would then contrast Adams would with the education of Henry Adams, which he referred to as 20th century multiplicity, industrialization, fragmentation, all that stuff. So for Adams, Mont Saint-Michel is this you know, kind of romantic place. It's an island readout from, um, uh, from the crush and omni, uh, omni of, of the industrial age. And when I read Fitzgerald's um, uh, My Lost City, in preparation for, for thinking seriously, I wanted to write seriously about Fitzgerald, um, Henry Adams came to mind because there Fitzgerald is writing about going to the top, he's on another island, Manhattan, the top of um, the Empire State Building and looking out and seeing uh, the limitations of this type of industrialized civilization. And I think writing very effectively and very movingly on that historical process. So these two men, uh, on these two islands, uh, thinking about where Western civilization is moving and the limits that confront it um, is for me uh, you know, just a, a really interesting way to frame um, historical thinking, uh, to frame um, the economic process and this broader thing that we kind of call in a very nebulous way, modernity. So that's my number two. Uh, and I will just mention to our audience, Kirk brought this up in the chat. Um, David has actually written a whole book on Henry Adams. Um, so the knowledge here is, is I won't say boundless, uh, but you know, we're just scratching the surface <laughs> of this. Um, but yeah, re really interesting juxtaposition, I think that you've called our attention to. Sarah. 
Okay. Um, thanks. So, um, yes. Yeah, so my uh, next figure is another uh, forgotten critic from the early 1920s who was part of the uh, circle with whom um, Fitzgerald was socializing, but also um, who he was reading. And um, this is one whose opinion mattered to him rather more by the end than Burton Rascoe's did. Um, by the end, Fitzgerald was writing letters to Hemingway um, using extremely vulgar and abusive language about Burton Rascoe, um, uh, also homophobic language, uh, which I will not uh, repeat here, but that was how angry he was at Rascoe by the end. Um, and that was in reference to actually a review that Rascoe wrote about uh, Hemingway, about men without women. Um, but so by the end, um, Fitzgerald was really reviling uh, Rascoe, but um, another critic from the time, also admired by uh, Wilson, um, after his death, of course, Wilson outlived them all by some way, so was able to um, pronounce on these, was um, a critic called Paul Rosenfeld, who was partly associated with the um, Seven Arts Movement and um, was a music critic. Um, he was an early critic of jazz. Um, he was, in fact, a critic of jazz in both senses of the word at the beginning, where he was not necessarily a fan of jazz, but then he... Um, um, began to kind of see more in it. Um, but he was also a, um, uh, he, was a he was an advocate, as were the Seven Lively Arts uh, um, people, the, uh, an advocate for um, an indigenous American art, right? And I think one of the things that I've tried to focus on in my work um, or to, to um, underscore um, is the degree to which when uh, Fitzgerald was writing and setting uh, Gatsby and, and um, doing you know, all, of his, uh, all of his novels except for Tender obviously, was a time when American literature was very, was really still wrestling with a sense of inferiority. Um, and, and I think we forget that now. We talk about Fitzgerald as the great American novelist and assume that he had some sense that he could inherit that mantle in an, in an obvious way and that that wasn't already a problematic category or something that had to be proven or established. And Rosenfeld and Van Wyck Brooks and others um, of the time, as many of you will know, were working to establish what a real American literature might look like. We might remember that uh, D.H. Lawrence published his studies in classic and American literature in 1922, in which he said that American literature was a false dawn, right? It had not happened yet. And, um, and so, you know, writing in that moment, I think, you know, for me, one of the things I try to do is to recapture that anxiety and that sense of defensiveness and of, of really having something to prove um, culturally and nationally, as well as individually. And Rosenfeld was really one of the early advocates for um, bringing together great um, American artists and arguing for their importance on the global scene. So, I um, mean, 1924, just as the Fitzgeralds were sailing for Europe, um, Rosenfeld published a book called Port of New York about this kind of efflorescent um, American art scene. Um, and he includes um, Stiglitz and Georgia O'Keeffe in it. He includes, so he's, a, he's a, you know, an ecliptic mix, not just looking at literature by any um, stretch, but he did not include uh, Fitzgerald in that um, book, but Fitzgerald wrote about it um, saying uh, to Tom Boyd, Rose Paul Rosenfeld is quite a person and the Port of New York is quite an adventure in our nervous critical enthusiasm. And I really like that phrase nervous critical enthusiasm because I think it picks up that, that anxiety um, as well as that sense of excitement um, and possibility. So um, Rosenfeld was, um, as I said, he was much admired by Wilson who wrote after he died that um, he wrote, when I first knew him in 1922, I think, he was one of the most exciting critics of the American Renaissance. Paul Rosenfeld seemed the spirit of a new and more fortunate age, who, this is still Wilson, whose cosmopolitanism was not self-conscious and which did not have to be on the defensive about its interest in the variety of life. His first book brought into range a whole fascinating world, coherent though international, of personality, poetics, texture, mood. Paul Rosenfeld at that time enjoyed a prestige of the same kind as Mencken's. But by the time that Rosenfeld died in 1946, he died in, in obscurity. Um, his star had completely fallen. Um, and that's partly why Wilson was writing um, this tribute to him to try to recover the importance of his work. And when um, Gatsby was published, 
Rosenfeld uh, released that same spring in 1925, less than a month before Gatsby was published, Rosenfeld released a collection of essays called Men Seen. And it was another collection of kind of promising American artists on the scene. And this time he did include Scott Fitzgerald. And he wrote um, to Fitzgerald after reading uh, Gatsby, uh, sorry, in, in this essay, he wrote, um, Fitzgerald has not yet crossed the line that bounds the field of art. He has seen his material from its own point of view and he has seen it completely from without, but he has never done what the artist does, seen it simultaneously from within and without and loved it and judged it too. Now I'm really interested in this moment because I haven't been able to establish whether Fitzgerald was able to read this essay before, uh, uh, um, in, in, er, in, in circulation before it came out because of course it was published at the same time as Gatsby. But in, um, so, and, and uh, Rosenfeld was also friends with Gilbert Seldes, and of course we know that Fitzgerald was sharing drafts with Seldes. The reason this matters is of course because it, is, it invokes Nick's famous um, Ars Poetica from Myrtle Wilson's party in Gatsby where he says that he was viewing it from within and without. Um, now, I have done a lot of work in establishing in other places where Fitzgerald I think very consciously does draw on specific phrases in this way. Obviously we know he did it with Keats. Obviously we know he did it with other writers. My increasing sense is that he was doing it with contemporary critics as well and that he was, that he was responding to their uh, criticism and their ideas with specific phrases that he found um, suggestive. And I'll just, uh, but also again, in this kind of like proving himself way, but I'll just um, finish Rosenfeld with a quick um, note because then Rosenfeld read Gatsby and wrote to Fitzgerald uh, a letter that Fitzgerald kept in a scrapbook, which you can still find um, uh, at Princeton. He wrote, the great Gatsby would have given me a diving rock better than any I had. It's beautifully done, breezy throughout like Daisy's sitting room and extraordinarily American, like ice cream soda with arsenic flavoring or jazz music, one word, jazz music in a fever dream. There were hints to be sure that Nick too was a great Gatsby who learned vicariously, but really Mr. F. Scott, the story is unfolded with all the suavity of the late H. James and the writing, the book felt like a dawn. Stop there. Oh, that's beautiful. And I love the way that you pointed us back to that, that anxiety amongst so many writers at that period about you know, is American lit a legitimate subject? Is it, you know, um, you know, William Carlos Williams was big, you know, shared a lot of these fears and those pasos and, you know, just a lot of the, a lot of the contemporaries um, are tapping into that same, that same vein. Um, all right, Jim, we're back to you. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great quote. Can you all hear me all right? Yep. All right, good. Yeah, that's, that's really something. Um, and I am old enough to remember when American literature was very definitely below the salt. Uh, if you were a serious person, you studied British literature. Uh, if you were not so serious and just tried trying to float through, you could you could always get by with American literature because you know anybody could teach it. If you're an American, you can teach American literature, right? And uh, that may sound quaint, but I assure you it's true. Uh, back when I when I first started, uh, so that's that's an interesting avenue to pursue. Uh, my number two has to do again with uh, some of Fitzgerald's reading. I think we all know that he re read at least some of the Horatio Alger novels of Pluck and Luck and uh, pulling oneself up by the bootstraps, all of that sort of thing. And there's really been quite a lot written about the influence on him of Horatio Alger having, having read those books when he was a boy. But there was another writer, a British writer uh, named G.A. Henty, H-E-N-T-Y, who uh, might have had as much or more influence on Fitzgerald. Hinty is mentioned in The Side of Paradise. Uh, Amory has all the Hinty biases. And I always wondered what that meant until again, uh, I did the annotations and I found out that Hinty was an extraordinarily prolific uh, novelist. He published in his life 
122 books. And these were boys' books, uh, stirring military tales of the British Empire, uh, really uh, pretty far to the right of Kipling, even. And uh, I got a few and read them. Uh, the, the titles will give you some idea of what they were like. By sheer pluck or a roving commission, true to the old flag, uh, forest and frontier. And then occasionally uh, he would write it about an American scene. He wrote one novel called With Lee in Virginia from the point of view of a Confederate officer in the Army of Northern Virginia. All of these were published by Scribner, Fitzgerald's publisher. Uh, and uh, I would be curious to know how many of them he read, how much he might have been subconsciously influenced by all of that sort of thing. Really, the, the hinty biases, uh, we would not countenance them today. Uh, they, they certainly uh, are very jingoistic and remind you a lot of the uh, British Empire and some of the assumptions that uh, people of that time had. Uh, but Fitzgerald uh, saw the romance in, in it, I suppose. And um, it's, it's the sort of thing that uh, it, it probably had a, 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 an influence on him when he was young. So again, uh, might be interesting for somebody to explore the hinty biases. Um, I feel like having finished all those annotations that, uh, as a friend of mine said, they are and Aladdin's cave to find out uh, what was actually going on in the, in the novels and the stories and in Fitzgerald's mind at a given time. Uh, when I read a writer, I kind of skate over that sort of thing. And because, you know, you're caught up in the story, you want to keep going. But uh, if, if you actually know what's being referred to, it often uh, makes a big difference. I've noticed, by the way, that you can have annotations to almost any novel or story or a piece of work that you're reading. You can have them in your cell phone. Uh, as we all know, all of Western knowledge is now contained in your cell phone. And uh, the other day, I was reading one of the mysteries um, by, uh, oh, help me. Uh, Harry Potter author. Um, J.K. Rowling. Yeah, yeah. Who writes uh, under a pseudonym, has written a series of uh, uh, novels uh, under a pseudonym, which also is escaping me. Um, uh, soon I will be non compost. But uh, <laughs> uh, at any rate, I was, I was reading through this novel, and she was on the streets of London, and uh, she was. Uh, describing all kinds of interesting things, uh, uh, churches that were there and gates and sculptures and things. And I said, oh, I wonder what that looks like. And so I just whipped out my cell phone and uh, I looked it all up and there it was. And I had pictures of it. And uh, it's, it's kind of like having your own annotations in your hand for any work that you are reading. I, I, I do the same thing with the uh, Harry Bosch novels by Michael Connolly. They're all set in Los Angeles. And uh, when Bosch goes to a restaurant or when he goes past a building, you can look it up on your cell phone. Uh, I don't know how much about G.A. Hinty we'll, we'll find on our cell phones, but uh, it makes me wonder if annotations for novels are uh, even needed anymore. Well, that's my number two. So um, number three then for me is Randolph Bourne. And Bourne was a, um, a social critic, a social theorist. Um, Fitzgerald died young. Bourne died younger, uh, 32, I think. Spanish influence about 1918. Um, was a, a real critic of the um, uh, First World War and got into a kind of an intellectual fight with his mentor at Columbia University John Dewey, um, because Dewey was on the side of 
preparedness and then eventually intervention. And Bourne uh, famously thought that the intellectuals had to stay out of the fight. Uh, I include uh, Bourne um, really though because of his work on youth. Um, Bourne wrote several very, um, uh, I think, strong essays on American youth culture. And, you know, I, I just want to read a, a, just a brief passage for one here. He writes in part, youth sees with almost passionate despair its plans and dreams and enthusiasms that it knows so well to be right and true and noble brushed calmly aside. Well, brushed aside by what? Well, by older people, um, by uh, a lot of, you know, Victorian pre-World War I certainty. Another way to, you know, kind of a, of a patronizing attitude. And, and Bourne was just at that age, late 20s, where he could begin to, you know, sort of make that transition from his own youth and, um, and begin to criticize um, the aged as, as he was becoming at that time. Um, the sharpness that I see here is, is, a, um, uh, is a, uh, an attitude that is not willing to easily accept these platitudes, to, to easily accept the notion that, that youth must defer culturally to the older generation. The connection I see here with Fitzgerald um, is, um, is uh, 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 something I find, I think probably most pronounced in the latter stages of this side of paradise. I think particularly in that scene at the very end of the book where you know, Fitzgerald, um, he has Amory Blaine walking back to Princeton um, to sort of, you know, sift through the bones of his own youth to kind of ask himself the question, questions about what it all means at this tender age. Um, who am I? Where am I going? And, you know, a car stops and it is um, um, uh, the big man. I think that's how it's referenced in the novel, the big man, um, the capitalist, the, um, the father happens to be the father um, of one of Fitzgerald's classmates who did not survive the war. And Amory says, you know, there I was sort of fighting for defending my generation with this capitalist who sort of, you know, helped us to get involved in this war and couldn't see it, didn't understand the irony, but knew that he was touched deeply, hurt because of his son's death. And Amory says, there I was arguing for socialism. I'm not even really a socialist, but I'm struggling. I'm trying to find myself, trying to discover where this culture is moving. And in so many words, um, what is the role, what is the place for youth in the society? That's probably a different question for people in the Western world in 1920, 1921, than it was for youth in 1910 up until the summer of, of 1914. Um, Bourne, I think, grows into that question, and Fitzgerald approaches it uh, in the early 1920s from, I suspect, a, a not so similar position. So, so Bourne would be my number number three. Excellent. I was I was muted. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, we'll pick up the baton. Um, so. Um, yeah, it's great to have uh, Bourne brought back into the uh, conversation. I see that's also pleased Kirk, um, which is uh, which is good news. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, now bring in another critic uh, from the era uh, and another one whose opinion Fitzgerald, um, uh, whose, whose opinion mattered to Fitzgerald. Um, as uh, we all know. Um, Gatsby was uh, notoriously not particularly well appreciated. Fitzgerald was very frustrated by its reception. And then the exception to that tends to be the same handful of critics where we note that Gilbert Seldes admired it. We note that Mencken was, you know, didn't get it, but sort of, you know, saw um, some of it. Um, and of course, there's a very famous letter that Fitzgerald wrote to Wilson in the summer of 1925 complaining about um, how few people had understood it, uh, where he likens it uh, to uh, the brothers Karamazov, um, saying without making any invidious comparisons between class A and class C, if my novel is an anecdote, and this of course is response to Mencken uh, calling it a glorified anecdote, he says, if my novel is an anecdote, so is the brothers Karamazov. From one angle, the latter could be reduced into a de detective story, 
But then he says that the letters from Wilson and Mencken have compensated me for the fact that all of the reviews, even the most enthusiastic, um, that, that of all of them, none had the slightest idea what the book was about. Now that passage is often quoted, you'll all know it probably verbatim, um, and will have caught me misreading it there. Um, but what often drops out there is that um, at the end of that uh, kind of little diatribe, um, he says, I wonder what Rosenfeld thought of it. And then he gets Rosenfeld's letter, Rosenfeld's letter saying that it would have given him a better diving rock for men seen um, uh, if he'd had it than the beautiful and damned did. Um, so we know that uh, the opinion of some of these critics mattered to him. And another one who was important, um, and again, whose letter he about Gatsby he saved in the archive was Deems Taylor. Now, I'm very fond of Deems Taylor, partly because I love the letter that he wrote to Fitzgerald um, about Gatsby, but also because he's such an unexpected figure in several ways to keep cropping up in um, this story. He was uh, a music critic primarily, again, um, uh, and, and unlike Rosenfeld, not somebody who branched out into literary criticism or other kinds of arts criticism. He was very much a musician, um, music critic, musicologist, and composer. Uh, he composed modern opera. He wrote, um, uh, an opera called The King's Henchman with Edna St. Vincent Millay as his librettist in 1921. He wrote, uh, he composed a version of Peter Ibbotson. Both of those were for the Metropolitan um, Opera. He is perhaps most famous in American popular culture these days now though, um, for his appearance in Walt Disney's Fantasia, where he is the MC who talks to Stravinsky and he's the one who comes in and talks to Mickey Mouse at the beginning with his kind of um, nasal twang. And so um, Deems Taylor has been uh, immortalized on celluloid um, in Fantasia. But um, he was uh, also, as I say, the music critic uh, for, for the New York world. In fact, he worked for Herbert Bayard Swope. Um, and Swope, obviously, as we know, um, was one of uh, Fitzgerald's neighbors, broadly speaking, in uh, Great Neck, and was also a thrower of great parties. Um, and uh, Fitzgerald names him in, uh, in his Man's Hope outline as one of the sources for his uh, memories of um, those glamorous parties that he's invoking. Um, Deems Taylor also uh, had a social connection with uh, the same uh, circle of um, cosmopolitan Manhattan Long Islanders. Um, he had an affair with Dorothy Parker in this period. Sources seem to differ on how serious and how prolonged that affair was. Some say it was very brief. Um, others say that it was, uh, that it was longer um, lasting. Um, and, um, and he also um, was uh, present at these parties of Swopes that Fitzgerald was uh, remembering or invoking when he wrote Gatsby. Fitzgerald names Deems Taylor um, in several of his uh, letters, including the famous name dropping letter that he wrote when he first arrived at Great Neck to his cousin Cece, um, saying that they're all of these celebrities and they all do their tricks and Deems Taylor was one of them. So he's already seen as a celebrity and somebody that was exciting uh, for Fitzgerald to be um, socializing with, but he also uh, clearly had a, um, a keen critical intelligence and um, and a, a, a flair for literature as well as for music because um, he also, uh, as I say, wrote a letter to Fitzgerald after he finished reading the Great Gatsby. Um, it's a letter I include in Careless People because I love it so much. In fact, uh, I use one quotation from it as an epigraph in the book. Um, but he, uh, in July 1925, he wrote Fitzgerald a letter at four o'clock in the morning. And this is what he said. It's just four o'clock in the morning and I've got to be up at seven and I've just finished The Great Gatsby and it can't possibly be as good as I think it is. What knocks me particularly cold about the book is not so much the fact that it's a thoroughly adult novel, which it is, and which so few Americans seem to be able to write, as the much more important fact that it's such a glamorous and moving one You've got the gift, uh, he actually says you've got um, Wells's gift. So reference here, of course, to H.G. Wells, who is, um, as I don't have to tell um, this audience, you know, a, a much admired um, uh, realist novelist at the time. Um, again, somebody whose you know, reputation is much more eclipsed now than it was uh, then. So he says, you've got Wells's gift of going after the beauty that's concealed under the facts and God damn it, that's all there is to art. And I just love that as a definition of art and as a, as a kind of definition of the Ars Poetica of The Great Gatsby, the gift of going after the beauty that's concealed under the facts. And God damn it, that's all there is to art. 
So I'll give Deems the last word there as well. Okay, Jim. My turn. I, I will mention uh, Randolph. Is that a dog? I believe that's a dog. Yes, that's Ronan. He has opinions. <laughs> my dog is here with me. Let's see if I can put him on camera. Do you see my dog? Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> my dog is, is very well behaved. Uh, Mine is not. <laughs> because he's, he's almost comatose now. Which, uh, which I think I'll, I'll be after this. I'll have to go take a nap. Um, but uh, the third thing I thought I would mention, uh, I'm at the point now where I'm working on and chasing down some of the uh, material and incidents and angles that I encountered during all those years when I was editing the Cambridge volumes. And I always um, said, well, I'll get to that someday. And now that I'm finished, I've been trying to get to some of these things, uh, just to write them up and see what I can do with them. Um, lately, uh, for the last two months, I've been working on the uh, dramatic version of The Great Gatsby, the script written by Owen Davis, the playwright Owen Davis, uh, and the play that opened on the 2nd of February 1926 at the Ambassador Theater in New York City, which, by the way, still stands um, until recently, maybe still, uh, they had a re revival of Chicago there, but it's, it's still there. Uh, and Fitzgerald's, uh, or the play from The Great Gatsby, opened there, as I say, in February of 1926. Fitzgerald was out of the country. He was in Salis de Bern with Zelda, who was taking the cure and the salt baths there. And uh, so he missed it all. He made a great deal of money from the production, but uh, I don't think there's been a whole lot of attention given to it over the years, maybe because he didn't see it. He wasn't really involved in it. And it uh, maybe just seemed like uh, a uh, subsidiary right that uh, earned him some extra money. Well, the scripts survive of uh, this play uh, at a number of places. There's one at Princeton. Uh, some Fitzgerald scholars have them. And um, there are two down in the Brockley collection at the University of South Carolina. So. Uh, I've been looking into uh, this production. I've had a lot of help from Robert Trogman, who is a wizard on the computer and has found all kinds of things for me about the play, about its reception, about where it um, took place. But the play had a good run in New York. It ran for 112 performances, which is good for a drama. And then, I didn't know this, it went to Chicago, where it ran in the Studebaker Theater on South Michigan Avenue. It ran there for a month. Uh, and then it went on the road. There was a road version with different actors and probably a shortened script. But the play uh, was presented in Great Neck, in Brooklyn, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Detroit, St. Louis, Denver, Stamford, Connecticut, and Minneapolis, right next door to um, St. Paul. I didn't know any of this, and uh, it's been quite interesting to track it all down. Um, February of 1926 was an important month. It might have been the month in which Fitzgerald's uh, status as a literary celebrity was at the highest point it ever reached. Um, the Rich Boy, the two-part story, appeared in Red Book in January and February of 1926. And then All the Sad Young Men was published in February 1926. Um, and so suddenly Fitzgerald was everywhere. He was in the magazines. His writing was being reviewed. And there's there are a lot of reviews 
uh, for the uh, drama. Uh, James Rennie uh, played Gatsby and got very good uh, reviews. And uh, uh, a lot of the other cast went on to good careers uh, in Broadway and in the movies. So um, I've been having a good time running all of this down. And I promise you all that I'm near the end and I will publish. And there's a lot of interesting visual stuff, too, that can go along uh, with this. So um, uh, I, I guess there's no end to the avenues you can, you can go down with Fitzgerald. And uh, I'm going to keep doing it as long as I can. So in the interest of time, it, instead of doing five, let's let's just pick our best last reference because um, we're already at or, or a little past the two o'clock mark or you know, the hour mark for various, you know, our global time zone attendees. Um, and you know, I, I don't want to have, a, we're going to get into fisticuffs about the best, <laughs> the best short story in the chat. <laughs> so David. So I'm going to pick a, a historical figure from my last this is Henry Clay. Um, I'm sure you know people know who Henry Clay is. Uh, Kentucky politician, uh, diplomat, um, known as the Great Compromiser for a series of compromises, which of course collapses and there's a civil war. Um, I, I choose Clay because you know Fitzgerald was was aware of Clay, and um, uh, you know in the swimmers, uh, his story, the swimmers. Uh, when he once said this this very American character you know, overseas, abroad in France, he has Henry Clay Marston. And I think there's a few things that are going on here. Um, Marston uh, is an eighth generation Virginian and Fitzgerald writes this. His grandfather freed his slaves in 1858, fought from Manassas to Appomattox, the new Huxley and Spencer as light reading. So his grandfather freed his slaves in 1858. So for Fitzgerald, this was, this was the quote unquote good Southerner, um, the, the, the Southerner that, that didn't require the war to free his slaves. He, he did this before the war started. Um, and yet he was also apparently a Southern patriot, fought from Manassas, 1861, first battle bull run, tap Maddox until the whole thing was done. In other words, uh, Fitzgerald is saying to us, you know, th this is not a man who, who fought the war about slavery because he didn't have his slaves. This, by the way, is a very, contemporary arguments today. I, I teach a course on sectionalism in the Civil War. Um, I, I, I teach it, um, you know, very close to, to, to borderland territory in Southern Pennsylvania. And there are still questions that come up um, uh, that, I, that I get you know, in my class, you know, was this really a war about slavery? And part of that reflects um, not just history, but popular culture. And Fitzgerald is writing, you know, very popular uh, writer for his time. And, and he says in so many words, well, this really wasn't about slavery, at least for this gentleman. And then he throws in here at the end of the quotes, uh, he knew Huxley, this is Thomas Huxley, and Spencer, Herbert Spencer's light reading. Well, these are, these are social Darwinists. And so Fitzgerald wants us to know that, that, that there are these good Southerners that are out there to the extent that, that Henry Clay Marston is modeled after Henry Clay, the great compromiser, and to the extent that he might be modeled after Fitzgerald's own father, uh, who of course you know had these romantic stories of of, of, of the Civil War as as, as a child um, in Maryland, um, you know that's up for debate, that's up for grabs. Uh, but what I find interesting about this is that, um, and I won't go into any great detail about this, but if you look at where Civil War historiography is in the 1920s and 30s, the interwar period, Fitzgerald, for better or for worse, he captures that. Um, what he references Henry Clay Marston, this eighth generation Virginian. So that's my number four and last. Okay, uh, thanks David. I was so glad you brought in the Civil War stuff. I think um, that historiography is so interesting as you say, and it's, there's so much that connects to, you know, uh, discourse right now and the debates that we're having. And, and but also, you know, Fitzgerald's, uh, you know, that he, the fact that he was a Civil War buff is something that, you know, all of, those of us who specialize in Fitzgerald know, and I feel like it's something that's so not well known as part of his kind of popular reputation. Um, and it's such an important 
um, um, part of what he does. So um, um, thumbs up for bringing in the swimmers. Um, uh, my uh, last one um, also takes us toward American historiography and indeed to current uh, debates, but um, to a different um, period. And um, this is another um, uh, critic and, uh, well, sort of critic, not really. Um, writer at the time, um, part of the circle, but I think if I've done it right, he brings everybody in. I might, I might lose a strand here, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, anyway, you'll see how it works. Um, but he's also a problematic figure. Um, so I've given us the happy ones who all uh, uh, understood what Fischer was trying to do and were um, you know, uh, liberal and progressive in their outlook about art. Um, but of course, Fitzgerald's circle uh, at the time was not always, um, that uh, that um, felicitous, um, and one of the um, figures who I've become really interested in uh, lately is uh, Seward Collins. Um, Seward Collins was a uh, was a few years younger than um, Fitzgerald and Wilson. Of course, Fitzgerald was a little bit younger than Wilson, um, but he also attended the Hill uh, Preparatory School like Wilson, and then he attended Princeton. He um, started in seventeen and graduated in twenty one, and uh, when he finished. Princeton, he came and worked for Wilson um, at uh, Vanity Fair. Um, and that was actually uh, how he kind of got his literary start. Um, oh, and also the, the New Republic, I think. Um, he, um, he, he kind of makes, he, he creeps his way into, um, into my account and careless people because he was the owner of the apartment where um, Fitzgerald and Zelda and John Dos Passos landed after their day of house hunting um, on Long Island in Great Neck that Dos Passos recounts in his memoir and that, and that he also um, told um, biographers and that has been you know, subsequently recounted. Um, and as you'll all know, Dos Passos is markedly censorious in that account where um, the, he thinks they're both vulgar and they're tacky and they're drinking too much and it's all very embarrassing. And then it's also, he rides a Ferris wheel with Zelda and it's then he has this notorious moment in the memoir where he says that that's when he knew that there was something broken in Zelda. Um, Beyond repair, um, a, you know, a, a line that has come in for um, much interrogation and um, and criticism, which I don't have time to go into. I um, uh, was uh, when I was working through the Burton Rasco um, uh, daybook gossip columns, um, I found an account that he had written in um, October 1920 or published in October 1922, where he had a different version in which he showed up at Seward Collins's apartment and found. Scott Zelda and Dos Passos all very, very drunk and Dos Passos dancing with a lampshade on his head. And I liked that as a corrective to uh, Dos Passos' quite priggish later account. Um, it sounds like he was having a little bit more fun at the time than he was uh, later willing to um, admit. And Rasco had another version of that uh, story that he left in his papers um, that wasn't published at the time where um, it's basically the same story, but it, in it, Zelda is hidden under a rug. Um, and her idea was that I was to ask her what's that after which she would spring out dressed only in her underclothes. But I didn't notice the rug until she was nearly suffocated. Then she took me into the bathroom and ordered me to give her a bath dressed as she was. And that's uh, Rasco. So Rasco stumbles on them all there. Seward Collins uh, would later have um, and a, a, a serious affair with Dorothy Parker. So um, that's his connection to Deems uh, Taylor. Um, and, um, but he also, uh, he and Rasco together, um, so Sir Collins, I should have said, inherited wealth. Um, and he was also famous for having the biggest uh, pornography collection in New York at the time. Uh, he was renowned for that. Um, and he would make people come up to his apartment and, and look at his latest acquisition. Um, but he and Rasco acquired the Bookman and they published the Bookman uh, together. He has publisher Rasco as editor from uh, 1927 to 1933. And by 1933, when Collins uh, stopped publishing the Bookman, he, his politics had changed from his early uh, liberalism um, to an avowed fascism. And he described himself as a supporter of fascism uh, through the 30s as somebody who was looking for an American style Mussolini and who admired Hitler um, when he was challenged on uh, what Hitler was doing to the Jews. Um, he basically said words to the effect that the Jews had it coming. Um, so um, a very problematic figure. He, um, how, how deeply held those fascistic views were is something again that is debated in 
the source material. Um, others insist that, you know, he was kind of an American style fascist, but not a European one, and that it was more polemical and rhetorical, and that it was more of an anti communist stand than it was strictly a pro Mussolini or pro Hitler stand. Although, as I say, there are these quotations in which he very much defended them, at least at the time. Um, how much his views changed over time, I think, is an important um, question for us to ask. And it's something that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about in that moment, um, and in particular in relation to Fitzgerald. You know, he described himself as apolitical, and we often still take that at, at face value and speak of him as an apolitical character. But of course, any of, of us who have spent any time in his correspondence knows, uh, you know, that he gave a lot of thought to, um, particularly to the questions of communism in the 1930s. And I think that those larger political questions obviously are so alive for us right now. But the ways in which, again, if we can try to recapture the contingency of that in the 20s and 30s, the sense that you know we have such a retrospective fixed idea about what those ideas mean and where they would lead, but of course, they have no way of knowing that. And so to try to get back into the contingency of those political debates and to understand the fluidity of the ways in which these writers might have engaged with them and been trying to think them through as they were happening, I think is a really important um, project for us, not just in terms of understanding Fitzgerald's own attitudes or other attitudes of the, the of his contemporaries or of the era, but again, um, in terms of understanding our own and understanding those histories properly. So I will stop there. All right, Jim. Well, I'll jump in and uh, <clears throat> that's really interesting. So uh, all of the testimony that comes to people when they uh, endeavor to do a biography. I think David would uh, himself testify to that. There, there are often a lot of things to choose from, a lot of different accounts of the, the same event. Um, I never heard those, those accounts. That's really quite something. Um, and uh, David mentioned Randolph Bourne. Uh, my last is uh, actually a connection with Randolph Bourne. It has nothing to do with F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, I wrote a biography a number of years ago of, of uh, William Styron, the author of Sophie's Choice, Confessions of Matt Turner, and Darkness Visible. And um, when Styron was writing his first novel, uh, Lie Down in Darkness, he was having a lot of trouble. Uh, he just couldn't get it to go. And so he was, he was living in New York City, but nothing was happening. And so friends invited him to live in rent-free in uh, their vacation home out in a little town, a little village called Valley Cottage, which is on the Hudson River. This was 1949. And he went out there and made up his mind that he was going to break through. And he did, in fact, do it. And uh, he got his first novel going. It was Lie Down in Darkness, eventually published in 1951. Uh, well, he wrote that novel on Randolph Bourne's desk. Um, somehow or another, these people had been friendly with Randolph Bourne, who by then was gone. And they had the tilting desk that he used. It was one of those desks that uh, the draftsmen use. You all know what I'm talking about. It, it tilts at different angles and uh, you, can, you can do your uh, figurations upon it. There's even a picture of Styron sitting at that desk and writing Lie Down in Darkness. So this is the sort of thing you get into when you do biography. I decided I was going to track that desk down. I was going to acquire it. I was going to make it mine. Um, and I did, in fact, find the daughter of uh, the two women who owned that place in Valley Cottage. And I asked her about it. And alas, it went to the junk man when they cleaned the place out. So it was a narrow miss. Uh, but William Styron wrote his first novel on the tilting draftsman's desk of Randolph Bourne, uh, who was, in fact, a very important journalist in his time. And uh, as David says, would uh, uh, repay 
some more attention. So that's all I got today. I'm the one that made us late, so I'll, I'll cut it off here. Wonderful. Um, we have a really quick question in the Q&A about whether or not they met Carl Jung uh, <laughs> while they were in Switzerland. Um, I'm not aware of any specific references to Jung from my work on Tender, but I know that they were obviously in touch with Forel and Bloyer and a number of the other luminaries of that circle. But Jim, I think you're probably the, the expert to ask. I believe I'm right that um, I, I can be corrected on this. I believe that Jung made his diagnosis from notes taken by others of Zelda's therapists. I'm not sure he ever actually met her, and I don't believe Fitzgerald met him. Uh, I think I'm right about that, but they did get the diagnosis, and it was uh, schizophrenia, as they call it, in a diagnosis that has changed a lot over the years. But uh, that's all I can dredge out of my uh, memory at the moment. He did have an affair with the uh, student of Young's there at the over that Christmas holiday of 1931, and I can't can't remember her name, but she pops up in one of those uh, short stories from that era, um, where he's choosing between the divorcee and the southern girl who's supposed to be Zelda when she was young, and the details are totally slipping my mind. But um, that's a I think that's probably the closest connection. We do have time for some other questions, though, if, if folks. Can I, can I pick up one that's yeah. in the chat? Definitely. Um, there's, a, there, there's also a question about Pound there, um, which is something that I've uh, tried to chase up. So Pound moved to Italy in 1924, just as Scott and Zelda came to um, France. I don't have any indication that I haven't found any, but you know, um, Jim and others may know. Um, of whether they ever um, sought him out in Rome when they were there in November. I can't find any evidence that they did. So um, my expectation is that they never met Pound, but of course um, they certainly, you know, had lots of mutual friends and, um, and knew all about him. But I don't know of any evidence that they ever uh, met unless anybody else does. I would love to know if, if anybody does know that they met in Rome, but maybe Martina, Martina should know. <laughs> but Martina, we're gonna make you responsible for all things Rome. <laughs> like oh great <laughs> i do know that's not where much is from by the way that's probably a joke <laughs> any other questions all right well i want to thank everybody aaron i want to thank you for being the hostess with the mostess and keeping the round table going uh and our panelists I, I i just really don't know what to say i mean i think the word that keeps popping up is historiography and I really do believe that that is just such a wonderful um, sort of avenue for us to, to dive into. And I think what this panel has demonstrated that all of these references that make the uh, fiction so vividly alive of, of the time are really rabbit holes. And they're great opportunities for us to just kind of uh, dive deep and really um, get to know the texture of both the 20s and the 30s a lot better than I think we do on the surface. Um, you know, teaching the same familiar references and allusions all over again. So this panel could not have been uh, uh, more perfect than, than what we, I think the, what the board envisioned when we came up with this idea. So David, thank you again. David's uh, most recent book is a biography of Henry Adams and it's, it's really a fantastic read. Sarah's book, um, you know, Careless People, I think we're probably all familiar with that now, but um, Behold America is absolutely vital in this day and age. And I, I don't know if, are we allowed to say what you're wrapping up or is that top secret? Mm -hmm. So Sarah's no, next- No, it's, it's being made public now. <laughs> okay, so Sarah's next book is on, you did mention it, but I guess you did mention it, sorry. is on the um, Gone with the Wind, so, um, very excited to to see what she's doing with that. And Jim, I don't know what we can say about Jim, except next time he's out of town, we're going to break into his house and steal that copy of Metropolitan that's hangs on his wall there. <laughs> um, 
Jim has been a mentor to so many of us and, and just such a, uh, we are all very fortunate that we came into this profession at a time where we had uh, great encouraging folks like Jim West and that's above and beyond in, you know, all the great work he's done on the annotations. Uh, hopefully the storm will, the, 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 hopefully we've created the F Scott Fitzgerald force field around uh, around your abode there, so you'll you'll be safe. Um, just as a quick reminder, we'll be back on Monday with a um, uh, a little video tour to different spots around the world. Uh, not the obvious ones. We will not be going to Paris. I promise you that. Um, but uh, it'll 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 be a good little tour for us. Gail Sinclair and I'll be hosting that one. And then a week from today, again, we'll be doing a writing and publishing workshop with uh, some of our colleagues from different journals and different presses. So please, again, help us get the word out to that, to any aspiring writers or uh, any, any students that you might have that might be interested. Otherwise, I just say thank you again, and I hope everyone is enjoying their summer. And David, Sarah, Aaron, and Jim, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks everyone, that was great fun. Stay safe. Bye-bye.